and the printing of money, the monetization of debt, is a last phase in a long-term debt cycle because it indicates that when there's a lot of debt and there's a zero interest rate and you print that money, that debt monetization has its effects. You've expressed concern about low interest rates that often lead to higher debt burdens and inflation. Would you say that characterizes what's happening in the United States right now? Well, let me clarify. The three things that you mentioned are financial conditions, production of debt and money to monetize those. The internal conflict over wealth and other things, politics, the greater extremism, and then the rise of a great power to challenge an existing great power in the form of China. Those three things never happened in my lifetime before, but they happened throughout history. And when I learned that to be surprised, I knew knew that I needed to study prior periods. The reason we anticipated the 2008 financial crisis was because we studied the Great Depression. And so to answer your first question about the first of those, I view it just very much mechanically. Buying power, uh, which comes in the form of money and credit, when that's produced in a quantity, which is much greater than the incremental production of goods, services, and financial assets, drives those financial asset prices to go up. And the printing of money, the monetization of debt, is a last phase in a long-term debt cycle because it indicates that when there's a lot of debt and there's a zero interest rate and you print that money, that debt monetization has its effects. So what we're seeing now in the market is very classic. It's happened repeatedly in that that enormous amount of buying power created by the creation of money, which doesn't raise living standards, that is passing through the system. And so you're seeing it happen in the inflation of goods, services, and financial assets. With the large wealth gaps and large, not enough money in lots of places, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury were put into a position of needing to get checks out. And there's also this left-right conflict issue having to do with the wealth gap. And that means that you have fiscal policy that are now requiring lots of spending. And so the question is really, are the consequences of not doing that better or worse than the consequences of doing that? Now, when we look from an investor's point of view or an individual's point of view, we have to remember that you can't raise living standards by just creating money and credit, particularly if you don't raise productivity more than that. And that means that those asset prices are going up. So we're in the phase of the cycle, very classic, that the financial asset prices have gone up because you've given them more money, that demand is going up, and now we're having inflation, inflation of those assets. So if a lot of that buying power is going to be pulled back, particularly as we go into the next year, but there's still going to be a lot, and there's still going to be a high level of inflation of those types of assets. So the trade-off is always the question. Right. Okay. So quickly, where do you come out on that trade-off? Is it a binary yes or no? It's a, it's a reflection of the state of where we are in the cycle that we have borrowed. It's all the problems that we've gotten ourselves into by acquiring too much debt and spending more than we're earning rather than being more productive and also not distributing the opportunities and the incomes in a way that it's a broad-based prosperity. So on the one hand, you have prosperity that the bottom 60% of the population isn't participating in very much. And at the same time, you have, so it's creating that polarity and at the same time, you have the financial markets. So those are trade-offs that, you know, different people, the only care thing I care about is whether we're productive, whether we increase the size of the pie through productivity and then divide it well so that you create the something closer to equal opportunity that produces greater political stability and also draws on the population going wide. And the reason I say that is because I've studied these empires, these dynasties going back since the last 500 years. And you see the same thing happening over and over again. When there's a financial problem, when the granaries are empty and the coffers are empty, they print money. And when they print money and the coffers are empty, it devalues money. And with that, when you have a large gap of people at each other's throats, then you create a 
a risk of an internal conflict, the risk of some kind of civil war. And that is what I think is we're at risk of. Yeah, I want to get to that polarization in one sec, but just quickly on inflation rate. How concerned are you about it? I'm significantly concerned about it uh, because the amount of money and credit that has to be produced right. and is budgeted is a large increase. And yet, if it's not spent, it produces its own problems. The markets have a sensitivity to that. So what, what it means, and then there's a supply demand picture for bonds. And the way it looks is if you should get the selling of bonds, it worsens that supply demand picture because the way it works is the treasury borrows and runs a deficit, but it can't produce money. So it has to sell bonds. And when it sells bonds, um, if there are not enough buyers of those bonds, then the Federal Reserve got to come in and print money and buy those bonds. And the world right now is over invested in US dollar denominated bonds, uh, pension funds on the 60-40 mix, or, and they have negative real returns. And cash has a lot of negative real returns. So if there was a selling of that and a moving to other assets, stocks, other assets, um, commodities, other assets, or other places, other currencies, other real estate and the like, that selling worsens the supply demand power picture. And then if there's not enough demand, that means that the central bank has got to come in and print more money. So yes, it's not only the potent, the, the inflation that's in the pipeline or projected in that supply demand balance, but it's also what it could be if there's a selling of debt instruments. You write that wealth inequality often leads to the rise of populism and division. How bad have the divisions gotten in the U.S. and what's most to blame for that? Well, I think people around us, we all see it. January 6th was um, just a simple, but history has shown when the causes that people are behind are more important to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy. And what we're seeing is not a class uh, wealth gap caused by, accompanied by political gaps. So you're seeing um, that the left is more left and the right is more right. And you're seeing the conflicts within the parties. In the primary elections, you're going to see in each party a competition between the moderates and the more extremes. And so you're seeing that dynamic uh, play out. You're seeing questioning of election results and questioning of, of rules. So you're getting to the point yeah, something like 15% of, I forgot whether it was Democrats or Republicans, uh, wish the other member of the party would die, and 10% uh, of the other party wish they would die. They don't want their children to marry other members of the party. So there's a question of even how um, rules will be followed. And so there's going to be a conflict. And I think it's not exaggeration to say that you could see in the 2024 elections that no side will lose, that an accept loss. And you're seeing the movement to different states related to different values. These types of things have never happened before. But in my book and my study that I did to understand them over time, they happen repeatedly through history. So I'm not just looking at what's happening today but I'm finding that that pattern follows a very classic pattern that's repeated throughout history, which is the tendency of the middle to disappear and that you have to pick a side and you have to fight for that side. And that's the dynamic that is what I think is going on in following the classic dynamic that's shown in the book to have happened repeatedly. In the book, you cite the emergence of figures like Elizabeth Warren on the left and Donald Trump on the right. But Ray, do you think there's a risk here of drawing a false equivalency by framing it that way? Because Trump made concerted efforts to overturn the 2020 elections, whereas Elizabeth Warren wants higher taxes and more regulation. I don't understand why that's a question. I'm very much a mechanic. I'm not ideologically. I just take measurements. And what I'm saying is that if you look at the voting records of Republicans, it's the most conservative that it has been. If you look at the voting records and policies, Democrats, it's the most left that it has been. And that if you look at, this is since 1900, if you look at the voting across party lines, it is the lowest that it has ever been. So that you have, those are, those are just simply uh, facts. 
you have a party in which basically 30, something like 30% of the population is um, in support of more right, let's say the Donald Trump more right, and something like 30% of the population is concerned with the more uh, at the more left, and that within each party that there is then a conflict between those two things, and that the um, because of that constitutes perhaps the majority of those party members, then those that are in the middle, although they would constitute a higher higher percentage of the population, still let's say that swing 40 or 50 percent of the population, they within their parties are not dominant. And as a result, we're seeing that move to the more extremes of the two and the greater conflict.